is a difficult game to make, but we are happy to share the stuff that we think is cool. We're pretty proud of the audio. We worked on this for a long time, and uh, we put a lot of thought and hard work into it. So um, this isn't going to focus on the hard parts and the challenges of development. We just want to share a handful of things that we think are cool that would be useful to other people making open world games or wanted, maybe wanted to take a risk on some of the things in their game. Um, the audio for this game was done uh, by a coalition of developers, people from the publisher, which is me, and freelance people working out of their ho houses or studios. My name is Christopher Melroth. I'm the head of audio for publishing, and I was the audio director for this game. I'm joined by Finishing Move, the Bryans, who did the music for the game, and we're gonna walk you through a whole bunch of details, so thank you. Um, next up, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to the Bryans, and they're gonna do the first half of the talk all about the music. Um, so without further ado, the Bryans from Finishing Move. Hey there, I'm Brian Trifon. This is... I'm Brian White. And so the, we're going to talk about the music of Crackdown 3. Um, so the topics we're going to cover is the composing strategies for a large open world, staying organized across tons of assets, and then the benefits of composers implementing their own music. We implemented our uh, score for it. Um, so um, essentially, the task at hand with Crackdown 3 it was scoring the island of New Providence. That's where it takes place. Um, the New Providence is controlled by the evil Terra Nova Corporation. They've got their hierarchy of corporate gangsters that are essentially the bosses that control various zones and assets throughout the island. And so we had to figure out how do we approach music for this. Um, so these are the challenges that we face. The first is it's an open world. You can kind of do literally things in any order that you want. You can enter in a boss battle and then run away. So we had to figure out what is the music based around? Um, how do we make it support the gameplay? What are the, you know, what are, what are we trying to tell with it? Um, the, the next challenge is interactivity and it's to figure out how much interactivity do we want? Where do we want it? How much can we get, like given the limitations we have? Um, and then third, we have to consider the musical style, um, which is super important. And so it's what does this crackdown world, the island of New Providence sound like? Um, and with that consideration, do we need some licensed music to support that or are we gonna do all original score? So I'm gonna dig deeper into the musical style that we did for it. So I think the main thing that we're trying to achieve with the music was to just get that feeling of like, you know, you're Terry Crews, you're, you're jumping around on the top of buildings, you're blasting people, like the visceral, the fun aspect of that, the futuristic sort of nature of the world. Um, so stylistically, um, we came up with what we called cinematic cyber trap. That was sort of um, the combination of influences. And so what that ends up meaning is it's basically, we, we took a lot from like modern hip hop, trap rap music, so like big 808s, lots of like attitude and swagger and vibe. Um, some of the cinematic and larger than life nature that you get from film trailer music. Um, and then like we were inspired by a lot of the uh, like just highly stylized musical sound design, electronic music and bass music, like people like Noisia, Amon Tobin, um, Two Fingers, that, that sort of stuff. So um, with the, that music and that style, um, the way we approached it, and Brian White's gonna talk a lot more about this, um, we themed a lot of it around the bosses and, um, and their different zones and, and things like that, and we'll get into the details of that. But we really wanted to capture the unique and distinct personalities and quirks of these, these different bosses. Um, and so the way we approached that with this cinematic cyber trap style was essentially for each boss, we would write a linear piece of music, like a you know, three or four minute piece that has all of their themes and like just totally captures their vibe. And um, then we would digest those into the interactive assets later. So it's like creating a sketch that just totally covers the vibe, has the, 
the feeling, the melodies associated with those characters um, that we can use throughout, and then, then you know, break that up into the interactive assets and create more stuff based on those sketches. Um, with the music, we decided to do an all original score, so there's no licensed music. It's a lot of music. I think it's close to four hours that's, that's in there. Um, and a big part of why we did that was we wanted to achieve coherency throughout the, the musical world uh, in the game. So we wanted the music to sound like what you might hear like on the radio or in the club in the future. So to be futuristic, but also to have the cinematic and narrative elements that you can only get with the score of like light motifs and character motifs and you know um, being able to have the music react or foreshadow things like you get in uh, you know, a film or a very cinematic sort of game. Um, and uh, we also wanted to avoid some of the risks that can be involved with licensing music. Like one of the issues that's happened uh, in the past is, you know, if a game came out 10 years ago, and they didn't secure the rights in perpetuity for a song, because they never thought it would be released on Xbox One or come out on Game Pass or something, they'd have to go back and that can be a lot of headache, it could be expensive, or sometimes it can be just actually impossible. So we wanted to mitigate that um, with just all commissioned original score. Um, that's what we did. So we're gonna show you a little montage example of this cinematic cyber trap sound. Uh, this is with no uh, sound effects or dialogue, it's just cut to the boss battle so you can get the flavor of like the visual style and the musical style and how that goes together.
So how did we get all those sick beats to work in an open world game where, like Brian was saying, you can basically do anything you want in any order. So you can basically start the game and go after the final boss. And you could be in that fight and you could run away. There's, so you load once into this huge open world map and, and, and that's it. You can kind of go where you want, do what you want, or sort of not follow any prescribed thing at all and just throw cars around at people. Uh, so how do we sort of take and use music to support uh, the narrative uh, uh, of the game, support the story sort of, of, of direct players uh, towards things? And, and what Brian had mentioned is we sort of decided that we'd theme things around these bosses, these corporate gang bosses. And so I say it's all about that boss base. And so each boss controls certain assets in the world, in the island of Terra Nova uh, or New Providence. And um, the idea is these assets can represent certain missions that the player can take on. And if you complete enough of these missions, let's say you destroy uh, uh, enough turrets or, or uh, mine machinery, you can actually draw that boss out into a final boss fight to defeat that boss and sort of work your way through the different bosses in the game. And, and like I said, you can do that in any order. You can actually take on the captains before the lieutenants and it's, it's pretty crazy. You'll probably lose, but uh, you totally have agency towards that. Um, and the reason we wanted to do that, so music is not persistent because a lot of people play Crackdown uh, where they they don't actually want to go after the missions all the time. They just want to go run crazy in the world, collect orbs, level up, and kind of just do their thing, kind of do stunts in the world. So you're not hearing music all the time. And so we wanted to make music special in that it, it either informs you that, hey, this is, this is something important. This is a mission. You can take this on and sort of move through the narrative of the game. We also wanted to use music to... Uh, reward the player or essentially say who won or who lost. Did you die or did you complete the mission? Uh, did you level up and you hear sort of a, a little musical reward? Uh, and so we have sort of this boss theme music as well as uh, agency themed music for when you level up and accomplish things. So I've got a little example here of how a mission, how you would encounter a mission from sort of no audio, no music in the world to encountering a mission and then hearing how that progresses and completes. Enforcer operation you bust up loosens their grip on the island. Dismantle enough low level troops, you'll force their top dog lieutenant to come out and play. And that's when you drop her. Then the whole Enforcer Brigade goes bye-bye. Genius. Did I miss that last slide? Oh, there we go. That's just a picture of some of the uh, captains. And so you can see kind of how music comes in to inform you uh, that you're in a mission area, uh, then combat music kicks in, and then you get a sort of reward themed to that boss, uh, and you hear some of their themes kick in when you complete that mission. And the breakdown of this, like I said, there's nine bosses uh, that you can encounter in the game. And there's quite a few assets uh, for each boss. So we started, like Brian said, with sort of a sketch that was two to four minutes that sort of defined their swagger, their flavor, their, their themes. That helped us get buy-in from Chris, you know, make him happy, stoked on what that sounds like. And then we'd go and, and make almost like 20, 25 minutes of music sort of abstracted from that as a palette 
for uh, those bosses. So the ambient loops, uh, there's combat loops, there's three sets of combat loops, um, there's low health death, down but not out, uh, loops and stingers. There's also a whole bunch of just notification one shots. So it's not looping music, it'll be things like when you enter a boss's area for the first time, you'll get kind of like a little thematic 10 second stinger. Uh, when you see uh, uh, one of their assets show up in the world, you'll get a little eyes on stinger that's sort of themed towards that boss. So there's all these little sort of leitmotif moments uh, where you're hearing the uh, boss's theme kind of trickle in and those all sort of culminate in this final boss battle. So when you draw the boss out, you complete enough missions to draw the boss out. Uh, that's when you get these sort of uh, scripted uh, boss battle moments where it's, 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 it's loops sort of train card and we're sandwiching those between actual uh, scored to linear uh, runtime sequences. And I have a little example of that. And, and I'll, I'll annotate on the screen when it's, when it's actually uh, scored to picture uh, to the runtime sequence versus it's in the interactive music system and running the, the state system. Whoa, this place is seriously messed up. Well, well, it has come to this. I can take the pressure, question is, can you? Gate is trying to redirect the pressure to release valves across the plant. We need to hit those valves and purge the whole system. The pressure we sent down the line should have opened up the valves, but they're locked tight. All units, defend those control panels with your lives. Do not let the agent deactivate them. That's it, agent. Hack that panel to free up the piston and blow that valve. and the chemical plant blown to smithereens, Terranova's industrial division is on the ropes. The pipeline sending Chimera to Vargas have been cut off at the source. It'll be a lot easier to reach her, Agent. And we... So the boss battle is really that sort of the, when you get the full enchilada, you get the full beat, and it's this really cool visual thing. You actually hear it all kick in, and you've been hearing these themes kind of throughout, and, and, and that's kind of your reward as you're fighting this boss, this like super lit trap music. Uh, there's some additional interactive systems I'll just go through uh, really quickly. There's some things called reinforcements uh, based on a hate meter. So if you're just causing trouble in the world, the captains can come after you, and there's a musical system that sort of says like, oh, okay. Uh, these guys are coming at you. Um, the Kingpin, who is the lead boss, she can actually lock down the whole city. So that's like sort of like a big uh, re retaliation reinforcement from her. Uh, and those, you either win them or, or you die uh, to, to get rid of those. And then we've got some side missions in the game, propaganda towers and uh, these different races. And those each have their own uh, little interactive systems to support those. So I'm going to briefly talk about some of the diegetic world music. Um, so we created a whole bunch of stuff for, there's lots of businesses in the games and like, you know, nightclubs and things like that. And so we wanted a, a way that to just, one, just fill out the world and also to add a little bit of humor and just more color to, to the environment. So um, there's a bunch of these businesses that have holographic advertisements. And so we made non-looping jingles for them. Uh, and then for like nightclubs and there's like boom boxes that you can pick up throughout the world, 
we made you know cool looping pieces of music. We did over 50 uh, unique like little jingles and and uh, and and pieces uh, for the diegetic music. And by the way, in case diegetic, that means like it's coming out of something in the world. So it's you know coming out of a speaker um, or a holographic advertisement. So uh, it's funny because our background was actually started in commercials, so we were able to flex our, our muscle doing that. So I'll show you an example. This uh, is for the cash cow uh, loans business. Um, and uh, in the actual game, it would be futzed, but for just the sake of this example, this is just gonna be just clear. Um, so that is. So just, you know, low rent. <laughs> low rent television commercial, just to add like some more humor and color uh, to the world. Uh, so next, Brian White's gonna talk about uh, how we stayed organized across all of the tons of assets. Yeah, so this game was I, like almost five years in development and we did four hours of music. So just like lots of assets and then lots of time uh, putting that together, design changes and, and that kind of stuff. So we really had to kind of uh, stay organized and um, we use some, some typical things like spreadsheets, but really the most interesting thing I want to show you guys is something that, that Chris actually developed and it's these Visio flow charts uh, that, that really sort of take all the interactivity and they put it into this really nice visual so that everybody from us who are, who are doing the implementation and writing the music uh, to the coders, to even the designers, the level designers, they can sort of understand uh, and either comment or, or, or know how the music system is supposed to work. And this actually, uh, these things got sent in, in emails numerous times, like this is how this is supposed to work. But it actually, they're super effective. It would have been very difficult uh, to just dive in and create a music system from scratch in WISE with, without looking at these. And uh, yeah, so. Yeah, oh, I just want to make sure that was on. Uh, WISE doesn't have a good way to visualize your interactive system. It's a bunch of menus and lists. And so for our brains to be wrapped around how this was all going to come together, uh, Visio is a great tool. There's other tools like that, but I get Visio for free because I work at Microsoft. So uh, I use that one. and. Um, I wish that the interactive music systems would actually use a visual scripting system like this so that we could see how the music's going through as opposed to these sort of dumb lists that are impossible to debug once they're built. But we debugged the music system before we built it this way because I had to be completely honest you know, about how many cues I was requesting. So this is the entire interactive music system yep. uh, in the fully zoomed out view. And then so what we did is we, we mirrored this with an actual linear uh, spreadsheet. Oh, of, sorry, of, can you go back? One. Oh. Anywhere it says campaign gameplay, is, uh, no, no score is playing. <coughs> so instead of having like one big block where everything comes off of that, uh, it's, you're just basically understanding camp campaign gameplay is uh, just a simulation of the world. And then you can get in and out of any state by following the flow graph. And, and this really yeah. helped with the transition uh, matrix because there's like, you can literally go anywhere to anywhere. So our transition list in WISE is it's a bit insane. Uh, it, it, it takes a long time to load the interactive music system. Uh, this is just a linear list so that we could sort of, of uh, have a list of everything and then make notes on that. And so we check that in and out of, of Perforce uh, so that we could make either design notes or the coders could say how they wired it up. Uh, or we could just keep track of how many minutes we were writing for the different cues and transitions. And then this is just a quick example of, of just some wise organization. We're, we're uh, very, very organized uh, with such a big game and, and we had very specific naming conventions on everything that sort of lasted uh, throughout the development. There's even typos that Chris made that we just, we kept. <laughs> those naming conventions so that everything stayed through, uh, true all the way to ship. Um, 
And I really like to use a lot of, of folders and all the labeling capabilities that WISE has. Uh, it's really useful in the interactive music system, especially for transitions, like transitions to and from folders instead of just like having to make one for every individual asset. And uh, naming your transitions, because we, had, we probably had at least a few hundred, maybe like 500 plus transitions in there that needed to be accounted for. Um, and then finally, I'll just talk really briefly about uh, composers as implementers. So uh, we built the whole music system uh, in WISE, so it wasn't a system that already existed that we just threw assets into. I actually took those design documents and I built the entire system myself. So I knew exactly how it was supposed to work and how everything wired up, how the states worked, how the stingers worked, how the transitions worked. Uh, and, and really the benefit of this is just being able to provide instant feedback that, that instructs the composition process. So we could iterate ourselves just by testing, either in Soundcast or testing in a build to know like, yep, that's not gonna work, or that transition needs to be twice as long, needs to be half as long, you know, just those basics. And, and, and I think that's, you hear that a lot, like, oh yeah, you know, composers should, should implement because then they can make better music. And I think the, the biggest, uh, one that we ended up uh, figuring out late in, in the, the development cycle was just being able to own the polish and find and, and fix bugs a lot faster. So uh, in the last two months of, of the game before ship, I was playing every day, probably three, four hours a day, uh, just playing the build and then back in wise. And I was catching bugs that uh, testing was not catching, nobody else in, on, on the sound team was catching, just because I knew exactly how all the specific little systems worked. Uh, and then I was able to go in and fix those bugs, or in the event where there might not be code support, just come up with creative solutions for making it work. You know, like, oh, I can, I can tweak this, I can make this, and, and we can make it work with what we have. And I think that, uh, is, is pretty difficult if you're also relying on a sound designer who's implementing the music and they've got a million things. Uh, it was amazing for me as the audio director because at the end, I'm just chasing a million bugs and especially perf on this game was a real problem. And uh, <laughs> Ryan White like just, hey, I fixed this today. Okay, sounds awesome, buddy. It was far too big a game to play through uh, on a daily basis, so. Yeah, so, and then just a couple of the challenges with that, we were working uh, on this coast, and there was also uh, teams uh, in the UK. So there's just your typical, you know, sync time differences. Like, yeah, I'd lose per force access uh, in the middle of the day, and they'd all be sleeping. So just those kind of things, uh, and keeping up with with those changes. But uh, in the end, it, it was actually super valuable, um, and it and it wasn't that hard to sort of embed in the development process uh, and really add a lot of value uh, to the team. You want to do this yeah, last one? Sure. Uh, so we're going to hand it over to Chris, just the key takeaways just in terms of, so composing for an open world, you have to have a unique approach and think about like what is the music based around um, with obviously the organization as, as Brian showed, it's like having different ways of communicating that information beyond just a single spreadsheet really helps keep everybody across teams all on the same page and then you know, the composers implementing their music, then you can react to things very fast and just get it going. So now we're gonna hand things over to Chris for his portion of uh, the talk. All right, time check. I think you guys are right on schedule. Yeah, yeah. you got 30 minutes. Hang on, all right. I got 80 slides to do in 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm gonna not micro machines it, but I'm gonna gloss over some of the details that are up here and you can always get the slide deck later and, and dig into the numbers if you would like to see more details. All right. I'm gonna focus on some sound design systems and some mix stuff that we did. Um, in the front, when we get to the destruction section, James Nixon, Nixon and Dan Krislip right here in the front row actually made all these slides and they did all the hard work on this and all I had to do was copy and paste them in here and make it sound dumber um, for myself to, to present. So thank you guys and they did an amazing job on this game. Um, all right, so, uh, we wanted kind of cool acoustics and we needed to do it super cheap and super fast. So I'm gonna share how we did that because I think it sounds all right. Um, the, if you don't know what Crackdown is, there's two modes. There's campaign and multiplayer. The multiplayer uh, hosts uh, 10 players 
in a fully destructible world, you can take down entire buildings piece by piece, like literally piece by piece. So um, in order to play the physics sounds for all that, it was an incredible technical challenge. So I'm gonna share how we do that. Uh, we have a individual system that is also part of destruction, but turbulence. So it's something that I personally have always wanted to get into a game because I hate it when a physics object's flying through the air and it's just silent. I want that movie whoosh as it goes by. So I'm gonna share how we did that. Um, just a real quick short thing on LFE because um, as being in the publisher side, we work on a bunch of different games and I see a lot of inconsistency about how people treat LFE and I'm a huge fan of LFE. Um, I'm gonna share at least like how we, how we thought about LFE on this game. Uh, and then I'll show you some, I'm gonna try to get to the mix stuff as fast as possible because there's a lot of detail there. And uh, mix is on everyone's mind. All right. Uh, so the acoustic system, um, I did some sessions with a blind gamer named Sightless Combat, and he is incredible. He's an incredible resource. And like this game shouldn't be playable by someone blind, but I, I took it on uh, as a challenge of anything that would be good for Ben to be able to play this game would be great for everyone. Me, if, if, if he doesn't get a piece of audio information to understand where he is, where the bad guy is, what's happening, then it's actually a failure on the audio director's part to not identify that for all users. So he gave was generous and he gave me some of his time when he was in Redmond and he played the game with headphones on and I would just ask him questions. And the, one of the first things that came up was um, his ability to navigate the environment was pretty rough um, because really he just had to listen for either ambience or bad guys or traffic or something to try to get his orientation. Uh, but he, a big chunk of the game is platforming. So the ability to know where a building is or some sort of traversable object um, was uh, important. And the best way to do that is echolocation. So echolocation is really hard. It's a complex physical interaction. You've got a wave that propagates out into an environment, bounces around, scatters, and comes back to you. And it's how your perception of that delay and the loudness and the texture of that sound that comes back is sort of acoustics. Um, the whole game takes place in an urban environment, so we didn't have to worry about forests or caves or really anything like that. It's pretty much all city street and uh, rooftops. Um, it needed to be fully dynamic because I didn't want to build two systems. I just wanted to build one system and have it work for both single player and multiplayer. And in multiplayer, you can blast through walls and take down buildings. So the building that used to be there is no longer there. So we couldn't like uh, pre-process the environment and make some sort of uh, detail map uh, of the acoustic layout. We had to do something that was fully dynamic. Um, we didn't have any time to make a custom plugin for early reflections. And we started on this right before Wise Reflect came out. So we basically built Wise Reflect, but inside of Wise without Wise Reflect. Um, uh, they, that, that, it's an awesome plugin, and, and that actually does more than what we were able to do. But for how cheap uh, CPU wise our system was, um, I think that it, it sounds pretty good. Um, we didn't have any time to do manual markup. The city's too big. Um, so we couldn't like go in and draw zones or make uh, you know, low res structures that mirrored the game's geometry. And then also uh, acoustics are just noise. Uh, reverb is noise. It's, um, and so the more of that you wanna feature, the more noise you're adding to your game. And there was a whole you know, like, uh, insane design ethos that I pushed on everyone. No noise, no distortion. This has gotta be tight, clean, punchy, and I wanna hear tone, and I wanna hear power but without using distortion and noise, and which is, as we all know, it's impossible. But the choice to push that as hard as we could meant that the game sounds nice and clean, and uh, I didn't want to muddy that up. So when you decide to use distortion or noise, it's intentional. You're not just using it on everything and then, tr and then trying to figure out how to get the noise and distortion out of your game once it's all baked in. So if we're gonna add uh, acoustics into the game, we didn't want to undo all that hard work that we had done. Um, all right, so the technology that we employ to get the data back and, and you know, make a sense of the acoustics are pretty simple. We cast, ray, uh, ray cast in five directions. We do five rays per frame, that's it. Um, we do them on the corners and we do one overhead. Um, and uh, it's all listener relative, so it comes out from the listener, which in our game is the camera, because I think the camera is the best listener. I don't like to fudge with it and like move it in between or put it on a spline or put it on the character. I just like camera, because what I see is what I hear. Um, uh, we then take the data output by the rays and we do two things with it. We turn that data into RTPC uh, parameters, 
that we use to manipulate all the different sends and do some other trick stuff with. But that data also under the hood determines how we interpolate between the delays. So we go out to 50 meters because that's kind of what we, you couldn't really afford more. Every game defined send and wise that you add is uh, extra overhead per voice. And given how the scale of this game and how many bad guys we can throw at you and stuff, we're often running you know, 900, 1500 sends with this system. So if you even just add one more, you're multiplying out and it gets crazy. So uh, I would have loved to have gone out to 250 meters so that we could have done procedural echoes and everything, but uh, 50 meters was like a good compromise. Um, then we take both uh, the actor mixers and the output of the game defined sends and we route those through some reverbs, one of which is close and one of it is, which is distant. Both of those are using impulse responses that were recorded in city streets. And uh, we, I'll show you how we do that stuff. So um, I'm gonna skip that. I think you can barely see it because it's a single pixel that's, that's moving around, but um, a, a single ray cast is far too rigid. Uh, so what we do is we jitter them and we take the output of the jitter and we uh, average that over time. Then I take the output of that and I also smooth that in wise just because it was a, still a little too twitchy. Um, and uh, we stop ray casting at 50 meters. Beyond that point, we, aren't, we don't have any delays to go to, so um, it's a slight optimization. All right, so the uh, RTPCs that we create are uh, each direction, we, we measure the distance between the ray from the listener to the object that it's striking. Um, we use that for attenuating the delays, so we're interpolating to different delay lines so that farther away, there's a longer delay before the slap comes back, and different longer time between the slaps. And then we use that distance to attenuate it as though it's getting quieter because there's no object out there. It's not actually in 3D, it's just sending to one that's hard panned, uh, a bus that's hard panned here, here in each direction, matching the orientation of the rays. Um, we also get, uh, in order to further reduce noise, reverb sounds pretty bad if you have all these reflections and all this reverb and then you're folding it down to stereo. Um, so we detect the endpoint that the person's listening on, and if, it's, uh, if they don't have those speakers, we just mute those in the reverb. So I, I mute the bus, like if there's no rears, rear reflection's gone, rear reverb gone, overhead, same thing. Um, and that way, when, so you're not folding down reflections of things that you don't have speakers for back and doubling them up. Um, you might even hear in a few of these captures, I forgot to toggle back to stereo because the video capture actually folds down internally and it does a terrible job at it. So if you hear any weirdness with like some flangey stuff, it's actually the, the delays getting folded down. Fold, folded down, I can speak. Um, all right, and then, uh, and then we just take a, the rudimentary values that we're getting back from all those rays and we create a super low res version of the volume of the space that you're in. And that's not meant for any detail other than big space or small space. And between those ranges, um, up to a, a million cubic meters, uh, we can determine how much we want to send to the close reverb and how much we want to send to the far reverb. Uh, the reverbs are just stock-wise convolution reverbs, um, and then these are some of the parameters that we use to uh, control them and, and shape them. So if you're in a smaller space, it's got less spread and it's a little bit hyped uh, in the loudness, and as you go into a larger space, um, it opens up and it gets uh, into the wider space that comes up in volume and the close one comes down. Super simple, like nothing special about it. Just trying to solve problems and be clever with what we had. All right, so I've got a series of videos to show this off. Uh, hopefully it reads in here, it's a big echoey room. But um, this is the dry signal of the carbine in a test level. All right, next one is uh, early reflection soloed. So if you hear something, that means that there's a reflection coming off of that geometry. Super simple. It is filtered just a little bit because we don't want to send so much low end and we don't want to send so much high end, so it's band passed. And it gets more band passy the farther away it is from you. Um, this is only the distant reverb. So as you can see, as I get away from that geometry, the space volume increases. And uh, that was hard to hear. Um, all right, and then uh, this is just the acoustics, not the dry signal.
So up to this point, now we've got everything playing together and hey, it sounds kind of city-like. Um, we didn't want to overhype uh, the acoustics. You know, we're not doing like battlefield style gun tails. This game is all sound design forward. So the sound design of the, of the gun itself is key. Uh, but we still wanted to glue everything together and, and give you that sense of being in an urban environment. So this is uh, with uh, everything, including the dry signal. So that's it. That's our acoustics. Um, the side benefit of spending some time on early reflections in that urban environment is that it sounds pretty good on voices. Some of them can barely walk, dead on their feet. Um, it also helps you judge distance. Just like a lot of people like that, the Battlefield talk, they did everything, like they, most of their system was player centric, same with ours. Our AI is really stupid, it doesn't really know much. So what we would do is we would pass a token when you do something to the AI system and say like, hey, player has fired a gun, so someone should scream and that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's better than actually having the AI try to know what's going on, that's expensive. Uh, there's also propaganda, so the, this horrible corporation that is totally not Microsoft, uh, this horrible corporate corporation is in control of the of the whole island, and um, they blast you with propaganda. These huge holographic, Blade Runner style propagandas, and um, sounds pretty good on that too. A vision of brighter tomorrows, a vision powered by human potential. Together, we will forge a bold new future. Together, we are Terra Nova. All right. So that's our acoustics in total. All right, cloud destruction. This is the hardest stuff that we had to tackle. I mean, it really took, honest, honest to God, it took a technological miracle for audio folks to figure out how to do this. Um, all of the physics for the multiplayer sessions are calculated on a server. It, there is no data for any of that destruction. None of the physics interactions, anything, exist on your game client. So, uh, we rely on all those values to determine, hey, a piece of concrete was flying this fast and hit this other thing, and I need to play a sound for all of that. And they're like, cool, well, I can give you the position of it, which doesn't help. Um, so technologically, it's, it's quite difficult and sophisticated. I'll just do the simple version, because that's how I understand it. There's a cloud server that all the players connect to. It's hosting an instance of the game where all of the physics are being done. All of that data is then sent down to your local server. Your local server speaks to your local client. Those are both on the same machine. And that then is rendered. Um, so uh, here's basically what it looks like with no audio on. This is the level of mayhem and chaos that we have to try to make sound decent and sound cool. And hopefully if we do our jobs, not fake because it's, it actually is all real physics. Um, all right, so uh, just real quick on some of the definitions of how all this stuff works. Um, we've got the cloud server, we've got local server. Some of the things are CPU uh, processed and some of the things are only on the GPU. Um, uh, Client-side prediction or CSP makes it so that things, you know, if you drop a packet or something, that something doesn't just stop and then update over here. It'll smoothly interpolate and if it has to rewind and fix itself, it's less noticeable than like not updating per frame. Then we've got some things that some really awesome, I, you know, it's really cool that they figure out how to do things only on the GPU, unfortunately. There is no data for us to tie into, so we had to write all these new systems to get, you know, basically query what's happening on the GPU and pass that to the CPU so we can do something with it. Um, there's a whole bunch of behaviors and that, uh, that we need to cover for each of these pieces, you know, when the whole building's blowing up. And then there's a tremendous scale. Tens of thousands of objects are updating across the network. Uh, they all have a different state. They have a position and orientation. And there's a huge range from, uh, I think there's even smaller than 50 kilograms now, uh, but 50 kilograms to like a billion or whatever is the max. It's just, we need to make, it's hard to make concrete sound huge. So we have to do that all in real time. All right, so there's physics chunks, GPU chunks, static geometry, which is like the ground uh, that can't be destroyed. 
Um, and then we've got impacts, destroys, and we've got a value of impulse. Um, we do it all uh, because of the nature of how the team is so distributed. We try to do as much as possible in WISE. So every physics sound in the entire game for impact is a single event call. It's play, physics, impact. And everything we do underneath that is driven by data that we query from the game and set a parameter to drive a switch. So it's, I, we hate the switch view, like with a fiery passion, we wish that WISE would fix it because it's um, terrible. It's extremely powerful and you can do a lot with it, but actually dragging things and having to reorder things and the fact that you can't sort to actually see what you're doing um, is like uh, nightmare inducing. Um, but the cool thing is you can do layers and it'll make stuff on the fly for you. Uh, it's got a lot of functionality built into it. So um, we nest the switches. So the first thing we do is the material and then we do the mass. So it'd be like physics impact is the action. Then we do carbon dark as the material and then we do the size, carbon dark huge. And then we go through all the impulse levels under that switch and, that, and we define what sounds can play at each one of those. So that, as you can imagine, our, our switches, I should have done a zoomed out view, but our switch view is, is enormous. Um, fortunately, the, uh, adding materials is extremely expensive for every department, so they kept the number of materials down to a reasonable amount because there are so many actions and so many mass ranges that we had to cover. Um, because we have to make actual sounds to represent the stuff we can't physically model or procedurally generate it, we have tried that in the past, it just is, it doesn't sound as good as a sound designer putting their creativity in and making it sound the way you want it to sound as opposed to how it should physically sound, like physically correct. Um, we take ranges of mass and we assign them to a single sound. So there's tiny, small, medium, large, huge, and then we even added enormous because we're running out of words to describe the <laughs> mass range. But it's better than like zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so, um, by taking a range of masses and saying, this is what we say is a medium sound, we know what sound to make for that size. Um, then within the range, the min and max range of that mass, we uh, track another parameter, which is the percentage, and we can use that to sort of pitch it up or down slightly to give it a little more gradient. So it's not just like, you know, some of the ranges are actually quite large, so being able to pitch it a little bit and give it a little more variety is, is much appreciated. So we do the same thing with impulse, there's a range we have to bucket it because we have to make a certain uh, a finite amount of content. Um, then we've got uh, a bunch of behaviors. It can be damaged, destroyed, it can move through the air, um, it can scrape on the ground, it can hit stuff, and then uh, they clean it up, and we call that a D-res, just like Tron. Um, because it looks like Tron. Uh, I'm gonna skip all this stuff because you know what ballistic damage is. Um, this is, uh, so destroyed is not when it's actually deleted. That's a D-res. Destroyed is when any physics chunk breaks into two or, or more smaller chunks. Um, and so it's basically, if you can think of it as something fracturing, that's, it's just called the destroy. Turbulence is cool and I'm gonna get into more detail on that, but basically as havoc bodies are moving through the air, you wanna hear a moosh. Um, and we do full content sets for every single mass range and speed you can have. Um, an impact is uh, if a physics chunk collides with either a physics chunk or static geometry, um, then play a sound. That sound, that system is designed to be two hands clapping. So I've got this thing hit something and this thing was hit by something. Now you get a sound. That sound is not a single sound that we say like, oh, it's concrete versus glass at this speed and everything. It's the sound of concrete hitting something and the sound of glass being hit by something. And we play them both at the same place, same time. So it's actually two both objects register their sound that they should play. And because it's same play, same time, you get an aggregate sound that sounds correct. Um, we have a bunch of different layers, that's so we can get perspective on the sound and, and tune it differently. Impact, resonance, which would be like, if it's a piece of metal, it's the ringing of the metal. Um, sweetener would be like, hey, it's a piece of concrete and some chunks fly off, so we wanna get a little bit of dust and grit and debris on there. And then LFE we do for sizes above medium. Medium and above, yeah. Um, and, uh, and the huge ones, we really just kick your room with a lot of air. That's awesome. If you have a 5-1 system, this is a great game to showcase it with uh, because we went crazy with LFE. Um, and LFE's fun. All right, uh, scrape is, so if a turbulence is in motion and not colliding with something, 
And then the scrape is it's in motion and colliding with something. Pretty simple, conditions. It's really hard to tune. That was actually our most problematic system because on the server, getting data back from the server to say, hey, I've, I've done like a bunch of collisions in a very small window, should I play a scrape? Um, is, uh, is still our most problematic system, um, and uh, it's just okay. But it's kind of nice when something is hitting and sort of rotating and falling that you get, you get the impact, and then it's got a little bit of a scrape and then until it falls, it's cool. All right, so this is an example of, with all that working, just destruction audio, so no weapons and no building level stuff. So the game designers were super nice and, and they decided that when anything should break, they should just play an explosion, which was really nice for audio. Um, and so that's why you're seeing so many explosions. Um, so that's just destruction audio only. Here's with uh, everything, weapons and everything all in one. And this is all test level stuff. In a normal match, there's 10 players all trying to kill each other and shooting stuff. So the audio director in me gets obsessed over the details. And I'm like, there's stuff I didn't hear. You have to kind of go, yeah, but you're never going to actually hear that that isn't playing that one little thing that rotated and fell. So we did try to get all that stuff. Just sometimes we have to make some hard decisions about what's most important. I'll get to that. Um, oh, and then we just play, we use the uh, server cleanup as a sound design opportunity. All right, so buildings, so those are all the destruction chunks, that's all the little pieces, that was probably the hardest thing to get. Then we can query the state of a building. A building is a collection of pieces um, fused together through uh, constrained joints. And once you damage it enough, it will enter into different states. Those states are below. Uh, we have sound designs for each one of those states. Here's sort of the definitions of how those uh, building states work. Um, it was really simple. We were like, hey, at 33% and 66%, can we just tr start triggering some sounds? And basically, where there's constraints, we can start to play creaks, and we randomize where they are. So when you're in a building, you can tell that it's starting to take damage so, so that you don't hang out in there too long and get crushed to death is the real idea. So there's critical. Um, the server can handle uh, one building collapsing in its entirety at, at one point in time. So if two buildings have been damaged enough to come down, one of the second one is queued. And so it enters into a special state and says like, dude, I'm totally gonna come down as soon as the other one's done. And um, we have a system for that. Uh, and then we have a building collapse. So here's just building destruction. All the physics sounds are, are muted in this one. Cool, so we can't really cheat in, in this game because you can go all over the place. Like we don't constrain the player at all, in, in, especially in multiplayer. So we actually had to figure out a way to get all the sounds positioned on the structures and do everything correctly. Um, when the server reports that a building is collapsing, we have that shepherd tone that keeps coming in, so it always feels like it's falling. Um, and then when the, when the server says, hey, I've stopped, that's when you hear it fade out. Um, just a simple little trick. We, a lot, we used a lot of shepherd tone in, in uh, in Crackdown 3. Um, so this is um, 
Sometimes uh, a building can be a building, or a building can be attached to a building. What's my time check? I'm at five minutes, oh crap. All right. This is breaking off a part of a building from another building, so it's a building and it breaks off. Now it's not a building. Now it's an enormous piece. Cool. Uh, and then this is a full simulation, just a whole building coming down. but I don't know, pretty awesome considering the technical challenges to get there. Um, and then the last part, I'll blast through this. Performance tuning was super hard. So basically, with tens of thousands of things happening, the first when we first started this, we were like, can you just send everything to us and we'll work it out on the client? And they were like, uh, sure, we'll turn, that. we'll turn on audio and pass the parameters that you asked for, and we completely took down the server. And so then they were like, man, you guys took down the server. You don't get any data. So, and we were like, well, we need something. So between some and none, or all and none, we needed to figure out what was the right amount of stuff to, to hit server performance and also give us enough so that we can do something convincing for the player. So we do a whole bunch of relevance checks. Um, I'm going to have to go through that quickly because I talked too long. Um, but uh, the way that it's done is we take everything and we look at, uh, we start bucketing things and we say, in this bucket you can have this many and here's how we determine what's most important and then it can graduate out and we filter, 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 filter and down to what is most important to send to the player because uh, server bandwidth is, is precious in a multiplayer game. Once it gets to the server, uh, so one, oh sorry, one of the ways that we do that is we merge collisions as they get farther away from you. So you need a lot of precision, like I'm standing right there in one little chunk comp you know, falls and hits the ground, I want to hear it like right then, I don't want to wait. The more you merge, the more latency you're introducing to the uh, sound because the server has to accumulate a certain number of impacts and then say, hey, here's a merged impact for all this stuff. So as it gets farther away, we increase the radius on those. That's a really nice optimization. We got a ton back from that. And we also bias that towards the view frustrum of the player, which has uh, helped a lot. So if you, basically it was like, when it was just a sphere around the player, Things behind me were totally taking precedence because they were huge or fast or something over the stuff that I wanted to see. Um, but that all had to be all that logic had to be done on the server. Um, so on the client side, we do all that whole process again because even the stuff that can come to the uh, to the client can swamp wise. Um, on the Y side, we do that again, but for voices. So we still like all right. Only this can come from the server, only this can get to WISE, and then once WISE is there, it's like, I can't really play back all that stuff, so I'm gonna do my, you know, the most important stuff of what's left, I'm gonna play sounds for those. And we aggressively limit and throw out sounds we don't want. Uh, we have a priority system for every single voice, and uh, so we, and we, it's a gradient between how heavy it is and how much impulse it is and what material it is. If you wanna dig into this later, these are the actual numbers we use for um, how we limit how many instances come through. And then here's everything. And then this is just to show you how extreme it can get. So this is a building with all the physics stuff simulating and the player still interacting with it, like still smashing it up as it's collapsing. And you can do that at 30 hertz on an Xbox One, which is the miracle part. So it's pretty cool. Um, all right, so turbulence, if something's moving and it's not colliding with anything, it's turbulating. Um, 
This has a lot of physics in it. Bad guys throw physics at, objects at you as weapons. You can throw stuff. You can blow things up into smaller parts and they fly all over. Um, I'm gonna quickly get to some examples. So uh, real quick, this is the scale of which every single little um, section you see here has props in it. There was a million billion. Um, this is an example of the spreadsheet that James uh, managed to track it. I'm gonna do the zoom out, yes. There's that, and then, oh God, uh, why did they make so many props? Um, and for most of those, we made unique content. It was 700, yeah, somewhere around 700 unique props that had a full set of everything from impacts to turbulence. Pretty cool. And then that's outside of the destruction um, materials and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we dynamically load those banks, that's, uh, you can imagine. So here's what you get with turbulence. Pretty cool. Guys like Ben, Sightless Combat, can now tell when physics objects are flying around. Um, here's throwing a pipe. Right? Here's a, a really cool one with, uh, that shows off how we take the rotational velocity of an object and we modulate the sound. And that last tip over, I wish we, I wish, the tip overs are, are the hardest because it's in, it's in contact with something and so Havoc doesn't give us the right data. But, um, and then, uh, oh, this is, this is probably the coolest sounding one, it's a piece of sheet metal. And as you throw it, you throw it like a discus and so it spins and this shows off what the rotational velocity is. Pretty cool, it's super simple, it's actually not expensive um, and uh, we have all that content now so it's good because other people can, use it. Um, uh, this just shows that we also do it for destruction objects. I'm out of time. Yeah. Okay, can I go five minutes over? Okay. I want to get to our mixed stuff. I'm going to cheat. LFE. We play some LFEs. <laughs> All right, so the mixed stuff, um, we wanted... Uh, Player feedback is essential, but we wanted the music to be nice and up in the mix. That creates contentions. You've also got narrators, as you heard, they just talk all the time. We need to make sure that you hear everything they say. Um, and then we just wanted to reduce cacophony and noise. We use Wise HDR. I know some people are saying they don't like it. I love it. This game would not have been possible without it, but it's not easy. It's really hard. You can't just grab a fader and be like, I want this to be quiet. You have to do all the math in your head and think of it in three dimensions. It's horrible. But, um, but the good news is once you get it right, the game just stays clean sounding. Um, we do frequency domain processing, much like um, the Just Cause guys, uh, where depending on what's happening, we'll carve out some frequencies. So if you can think of, hey, I don't want to duck the music when someone talks, super, you know, like six to nine dB, like you would need to when you have the music nice and up in the mix, but it, it competes with the melody. So I can bring the melody down, leave the perk and the bass, because there's no frequency contention there. And then all I need to do is on the, Percussion, just really the hi-hat is competing with the um, audibility, like the sibilance, so I just use a notch. Like I, uh, I use the meter on the output of the speech to pull these things down, so you, it's, if we did our magic right, you wouldn't notice, you can notice a little bit, but it's not as bad as like some games I've worked on where we've had to bend, like just dump the music so you can hear the voice. Uh, we also do some category to category things, like hey, if I'm shooting a gun and an explosion goes off, the gun can cut the lows on the, or the explosion can cut the lows on the gun and the guns can cut the highs on the explosion. Super simple and they just trade off. And the meters are really fast. We own fast meters on those uh, peak meters and um, they trade off very nicely. Um, HDR is great for sandboxes with chaos. Um, every single sound in the game is 3D. It was a decision that we made because I think 3D sounds are awesome and we wanted to make something that could be a showcase for spatial audio, which we're still wrestling with some bugs on. So if you play it today, you won't get that. But it's coming. Um, yes, we use meters too. Uh, here's some information you can dig into later about just some of the PEQs and ducking that we do. Um, performance was horrible. You're not the only ones. That's why this slide is here. We aggressively throw sounds out. If they're at max distance, they're a zero priority. We don't care about them. We just care about the stuff that you should hear. Um, and we limit all of our sounds to 50 max. This game, with all the things that can happen, you only ever hear 50 maximum sounds. 
Um, and the way that we do that is through HDR for audibility and then priorities. Believe me, you can't tell that we only have 50 voices playing. It's crazy. I was inspired, at, I was challenged by Bungie because not challenged by them, but challenged in knowing that they limit their voices to somewhere in the 40s for Destiny. I'm like, how? I played that game, like it's impossible. So I just wanted to thank everyone on the, if anyone here worked on Nimbus, that was the code name, or, or our friends overseas that, that worked very hard on this game, I just wanted to thank you, it was a long journey, and there was a lot of dedication from the added team on this. I love you guys, love you all. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.